Detroit Lakes has to, if Detroit Lakes beats Staples next week, they're in. And and I don't believe Staples has won a ball game this year, so I'm almost sure it'll be Detroit Lakes. Bemidji beat Detroit Lakes third game of the year, I believe it was 35 to seven or something like that. And and uh, we did uh, see uh, Detroit Lakes play Wednesday night, and they have improved an awful lot since the beginning of the year. But I'm sure Bemidji had too. So you know, I guess. You would normally feel it, but Midget shouldn't have any problem there. But, you know, in, in football, you never know because uh, anything can happen. Don, I mentioned uh, Titus Schroeder and uh, also uh, Dan Nelson. I didn't mean to pick out individual stars and stuff, things like that. Maybe there's some others you'd like to mention. Well, I think all year we've been, you know, uh, uh, what I call a, a team. Uh, uh, we win with team effort and we lose with team effort, and, and last night was no exception. Uh, we had some outstanding play again. Uh, first of all, I should probably mention that Kerry Baldenow, who has had an outstanding year for us, uh, both as an offensive end and a defensive end, uh, broke his wrist last night, and so that uh, we really feel bad about that because it's, you know, nobody ever likes to see an injury, and secondly, uh, uh, he also was a fine hockey player, and I'm sure that's going to slow him up there for a little while. Uh, the two Schultz boys, once again, had this an outstanding ball game, and uh, uh, Steve Lundin, uh, who was not feeling well at all during the game, and so we took him out of the offensive lineup, but uh, just came up with, you know, tremendous effort again, and John Milky probably had the best night that he's had, and, and uh, well, Dick Carabas was just telling me here that, you know, they were sitting on the other side, and, and when John hit last night, they could hear it way up there, and uh, it was, uh, hey, John, John's a super football player, and uh, he likes to hit. Uh, but the, I think the, the thing that we've had all year, and that and that is that we always had people that were ready when the, we had to have, have them. When Baldino went out last night, uh, Alan Stricker came in, did the job. Uh, it's been that way with our backs. For a while, uh, Pat Schultz got, uh, got injured last night. When Mo Button went in, he did the job. So it's a case where uh, uh, our kids have been ready when they've been called on, and that's all you can ask. And uh, so we're, uh, we're just just wish the season could go a little longer, even though we do have one game left yet. Uh, this would have been the year to continue, especially as long as we keep the good weather and have the good fan support. Well, you know, having those kids ready on reserve, as you mentioned, uh, to come in there and do the job, I guess, uh, says something about you and the coaching staff and, and the fact that you have uh, spent the, the years you've been here in building from the ground up, so to speak, from the lower grades and bringing them up and having them ready when they're Well, I, I think if, uh, we're very pleased with our program around the junior high and elementary and junior high and so on. But I think uh, the, the credit still has to go to the kids because it's darn tough to come out and practice day after day and, and knowing that you're not a starter and and uh, and so many times a kid, you know, I say, well, I'm not going to get to play anyway and so he's not going to be ready. However, uh, the last two, three years, uh, our kids have just been super and that they know that when the, the, the chances comes that, that they're going to have to be ready and they have been ready and, and that's not, I don't believe, as much uh, to do with coaching as it does with the attitude to the kids and that you know that they want to play and that that uh, they're going to be ready and so uh, you know this is if we can continue with this you know we're going to have good football okay don uh, we'll get back to you and talk a little bit more maybe you can pass the mic on over here and uh we're going to go back and talk with uh don stuby uh anything other than football on the fourth schedule that you'd like to talk about uh, coming up on at Fergus high well I, I really don't know the schedules so uh, you know the, the girl swimming team is going strong. Uh, they're full, full goal with their season. <coughs> Cross country is still running. I think they may have had their, uh, I think their conference meet last week. Uh, so I really don't don't know what's going you know, this week, but I do know that, that our sophomores in football will be finishing up their uh, season Monday night at uh, Wapiton. And our sophomores have had a fantastic year. They're still undefeated. And uh, so if they can get by this one, we do know that uh, uh, Often we'll be playing some juniors in this game, so it's going to be a real test for our, our young sophomores, but they have been playing outstanding football all year, and uh, so hopefully they can uh, finish that season without uh, without a blemish against them. I should get you to explain that setup, Don. As to, we talk, you talk about the B team, you talk about the junior varsity, you talk about the sophomores. How is that, is that set up? Who plays for what? Okay, when, we, when I say B squad, that's the same as our sophomores. Our oh. sophomores is what we normally refer to as either B squad or, or, or sophomores. Yeah. When we talk JV, uh, 
JVs. The JVs are mainly the juniors that do not get to play uh, uh, an awful lot on the varsity. Uh, you know, they're usually non-starters and so on. However, in our JV games, many times we will use some of our sophomores too. In other words, if we do not have enough, uh, well, for example, quarterbacks, we don't have any uh, junior quarterbacks. Our two junior quarterbacks are both injured, and so uh, usually in a junior varsity game, uh, our sophomore quarterbacks will also be playing in that. We don't necessarily like that uh, because it does give them an awful lot of football uh, game, which, you know, back to back sometimes, which isn't isn't ideal, but we don't have any, uh, like I said, the junior quarterbacks, and so uh, uh, the sophomores have to carry the load. But uh, now when I go to Wapiton on Monday, Wapiton has uh, told us that they only have, if I remember right, I think they said nine sophomores out. And so for in order to have the game, they will be filling in with juniors, which which is fine. It's going to give our, our uh, players a good test. And so, uh, and they have been, like I said, playing good all year. So uh, we'd expect them to finish on, on a strong note. The junior varsity then goes out and has some games on their own. And at the same time, some of them can get into your varsity. That's right. Our junior varsity, though, it, we usually schedule about five games. But whether or not the, the games are played, uh, uh, we play that by year. For example, our first year junior varsity game this year was scheduled against Alexandria. Uh, it was supposed to have been the week after we played them. Well, the night we played them, uh, their coach uh, requested that we not play that one for the simple reason that he had a number of his backs injured, and so a lot of these younger kids had to play on his varsity. Uh, and so we didn't play that first game with Alexandria. We did have a second one scheduled with them, and we did play that one. So we kind of have to play it by year, depending on how many uh, players show up that particular year and, and how we sit uh, in Wise. So there are many times we have canceled a the game, there's many times the opponents have canceled. So we really don't play as many games as we would like. We would like to play five, seven games uh, with these uh, players, and, and you, you need it to give them the game experience. And secondly, it's tough to practice uh, week after week, and, and if the varsity's got some close games, they're not going to get in. And so uh, uh, we would like to play more games, but if the numbers aren't there or if there's too many injuries, you just can't play them. Well, I guess that's, uh, that's the name of the game. You these kids a chance to get out there and do something and, and play. That's right. And I think, you know, you mentioned this earlier about our program. I think this is the key to our program is that, especially in our junior high, uh, we feel we have some outstanding coaches down there and we, in our setup, and that we have, you know, our 7th and 8th grade, we divide them into two equal teams or try to get them equal teams and then they each play a schedule so we can end up playing Battle Lake and Perm and Elbow Lake, you know, and, and we're going to take some of our lumps down there. But what's happening is we're getting a lot of young kids are, are getting to play football and that's that's what helps for example right now we've still got 46 uh, ninth graders out for football and if they all come back as sophomores next year you know, that's going to be a fine class uh, you wouldn't be able to keep 46 kids out as a ninth grader i don't believe if they weren't all getting to play and uh, there again we have two teams and each play a schedule and and so they're all getting to play and that's that's what's necessary i think first of all to keep the interest because what happens many times is the guy that's a star in the ninth grade isn't necessarily the star when he gets to the varsity and, and some little uh, little player that's uh, got all the heart in the world uh, just keeps plugging away and he ends up playing a lot of football for us at the end so it, the main thing is to keep him interested and I think we're doing that with that type of program that we have. Okay and uh, you want to make any predictions now uh, Bemidji has gone on out of the Northwest Conference and or will go on uh, more than likely they meet Detroit Lakes you've indicated you thought they'd get past uh, the Lakers. So. Right that's the way our setup is, is now, we know ahead of time, you know, who's going to play who, and and so it'll be Bemidji against Detroit Lakes if Detroit Lakes wins next week, which, which I assume they will. Uh, certainly, I think Bemidji would have to be picked, uh, and I think it's going to be a, a pretty good score, because Bemidji has, has size, and they got the good speed, and they throw the ball ex extremely well. The winner of that game will go against the Iron Range Conference, and right now that's uh, Silver Bay, I believe they're in. And so, uh, I really, we don't know much about Silver Bay, but uh, on the other hand, I think that I see Bemidji going uh, either to the, the, the definitely, I feel, make the semifinals and maybe in the finals, because they are a real fine football.
Well, that's what I was, that's what I was working for, predicting to see how far Bemidji might go. And I, but it's a little hard to tell these teams like Silver Bay, you know, you don't that's, see them play. You, all you can go by is scores. That's that's right. Uh, however, the thing about Bemidji is that they can throw the ball as well as run it. And any time you get a balanced attack like that, it, it puts a, an awful lot of pressure on your defense. And, and I just do not believe that there are too many teams in the state that are going to shut down Bemidji with both the run and the pass. And uh, you know, when they throw like they do, uh, you've got to keep some people back there. And as soon as you do that, then those big backs of theirs are going to eat away and get their five, six yards of crack. And uh, that's how they've been winning. And I think they'll continue to win. How about your nemesis of last year, Cold Spring Recorder? Are they coming back with anything? Cold Spring's Recorder is uh, has won their conference. The, the only game they've lost, they lost to Apple Valley, which is a non-conference game. The first, and Apple Valley is rated number one in Class A right now. And uh, uh, Cold Springs, uh, I think, uh, you know, have won their conference. They'll be in the state playoff. I believe, and I'm not real sure of this, but I believe they, they will go against the West Central team. And the West Central team, I believe, would be Litchfield, the way it looks. And uh, that, could be a, that could be a very interesting ball game. Uh, Cold Springs is a very good football team again. They had that, especially that real fine back, uh, Ricky Bell, I believe his name was, uh, back again. And uh, he is having a super year. And, and good, so, good football uh, name, Ricky Bell. Right, <laughs> right, right. So uh, they're, uh, I'm sure, you know, they're, they're going to be in the state. And they, they, uh, they could go all of, quite a ways again. You know, they were capable then that Bemidji will run into the Cold Spring Recall. No, I don't think so, because it's set up by brackets. Oh, and, all, and I look for Hutchinson to come through the other bracket. Hutchinson is, has not lost the ball game. In fact, their record over the last, I just read in the paper, they're 50, 58 and 8, I believe, in the last six years or something, whatever, you know. And they were in the state playoffs last year. They lost to Ricori last year. And they got those same kids back, and they have not had a close ball game all year. In fact, uh, I think the closest they've probably been is three or four touchdowns. And I just see them walking through that other uh, division uh, between them and Friendly Grace and the other, the other division. Well, if Bemidji can come in there and uh, come into that final game, uh, that again makes your team look pretty good. It's the only only loss you've had, and it was a close one. And uh, Well, that's right. We're, we're for Bemidji all the way that they come through because it does give our conference a lot of status, and uh, and our, our conference actually has, uh, has had a very good non-conference record this year, and so even that uh, speaks well for our conference. Uh, you, know, you take a team like Thief River, who is uh, probably down a little bit, yet they won their non-conference games, and uh, or most of them, and and so that uh, makes our conference just look a little bit better. We have a little time here, uh, Don. I guess I scared the coaches out to substitute here for for Oates, but uh, maybe you'd like to look ahead to to next year. You got I don't know how many you're going to lose, uh, but how, how do you how do you well, look for next year? Well, it's it's very hard to predict uh, as far as the future. Uh, we we have 18 seniors on this squad, and I think we've got. Uh, uh, must be about 22 juniors or so and uh, you know on paper it looks pretty good however we're losing some outstanding football players uh, uh, you take uh, guys like the Schultz and Lundin and Titus and Hansen and Landberg you just go on Baldwin now you can go right on down the list uh, there's some very fine seniors there's Kevin Stish is another one but you know they are going to be very hard to replace and, and I guess the thing about all of those guys Mark Tomardall would be another one uh, Ross Krogh and Larry Enderley you just go on and on all of these guys have, have such a fantastic attitude and you know that leadership is what you need if you're going to have an outstanding team and and we think we have some lion fine football players as juniors uh, but yet they still have to prove themselves and that's something you never know and you don't know that what the carryover in the leadership is going to be uh, we did say the sophomore class is very fine and uh, uh, put the two together who knows but the thing that we are not going to have that we have had over the last few years I think is the exceptional we're not going to have as much quickness and I don't think there's too many uh, teams in the state that have uh, four senior running backs like we have uh, Steve Undine, Titus Schroeder, Kevin Hansen and Paul Landberg you can put any one of the four in there and there isn't much difference and uh, that's a pretty nice uh, predicament for a coach to be in is to have to select out of those two you know, two out of the four but on the other hand you have a special group or a club that has an important meeting coming up. Well, let the country kitchen make the arrangements in their pantry room with seating up to 50 people. And add to that, uh, 
the great food and service, and your meeting will be a complete success. Well, come on out to the country kitchen and join us out here for a coffee cup any Saturday morning. Our one of his most grand Oates is on his way to Virginia for the Itasca Community College game this afternoon, which we'll have on KBRF AM. And let's go and talk with Leon Elseth now from the Ross State Tigers. Uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, Hillcrest with a big win over Lake Park. Yeah, you also knocked off the Parkers uh, in your game, which a lot of people were a little surprised about. Were you? Well, we figured we, figured we had a chance of winning the ball game, uh, but we had to play good ball. That was a couple weeks ago, and, and we did play airless ball that night, and the kids really put, the, put it all together, and we had probably our best game of the season. And this Wednesday, we went up to Audubon, and our kids put another one together. We beat Audubon 32-14, I believe the score was. And I was looking through your score here, and I don't, uh, I guess I don't have that one written down here, but uh, you did beat Audubon and Lake Park. Uh, unfortunately, you don't make the playoffs. Uh, you and Dick can never go to the playoffs together. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but uh, not too bad a season, though, for the time. No, real good season. Uh, up at Audubon, uh, we we jumped out to a good lead up at Audubon. We, got, we scored three touchdowns real quick. Uh, they were keying our right side, or a strong side where we put our slot back and so we just started running some counters and some trap plays back to the opposite side and uh, Craig Wisney, our slot back, he ran one back for about 46 yards and then our running back Wayne Paulson ran one back for 20 some yards. So we got on the board real quick and uh, the kids, I don't know if we let down a little bit, but then they came back and uh, drove one in right before halftime. So halftime we were ahead 18 to 7. Just my, getting uh, away from the, the recent games, I just wanted to make a little comparison here. You met Borup in the first game of the season, I believe, that Borup. And uh, so maybe you could give us a little idea of what Dick's going to face here on Tuesday night. Okay, we met. It was the third game of the season uh, that we played Borup. Uh, that we played Borup and then Hillcrest back to back two weeks. Those are only two losses. Uh, I, I see Hillcrest winning the ball game between the two. Uh, Warp has got a couple of real strong runners, Ms. Dabler and uh, Kappas, the quarterback. Uh, we figured when we went up to Borup that we had to stop the ba uh, Babbler, and we did stop him. But in doing so, we let uh, the quarterback do too much running, and he uh, broke a couple touchdowns on us. And so they, they're going to have to watch his campus get a quarterback. He'll drop back for pass, and he'll run with it. And uh, if nobody's open, and uh, he, was a, he was a tough runner. And uh, he broke a few on us. Uh, Hillcrest has got Strand back there that's a little bit quicker than our backs, our defensive backs, so they may not have the breakaway potential against Hillcrest like they did against us. Have you got another game uh, now this, uh, this Friday? No, we play uh, Underwood on Thursday night at Ronsay. What am I thinking of? I'm going to do that game. I want to either that or the Hillcrest game. So. <laughs> and that's uh, at, uh, at home for you. At home, right, Thursday night. And the Rockets now, the Rockets have been, uh, well, somewhat up and down. How do you see that game coming up? Well, we know they got speed. Uh, they're probably one of three, fa three of the fastest kids in the, in the uh, district. Uh, so we know we're going to have to uh, key, for, key on their speed. Uh, from what we know them, they like running outside, so we're going to have to contain them. Uh, actually, we know a little about them. We're going to get some information this week from them, from uh, some of the coaches we're going to talk to. Uh, so basically, we just, we're just going to have to try to stop their speed. But they've been up and down. They started the season fairly down. They lost some games which we thought they would win. But now they've come back and they played some good ball towards the end of the season. They did lose to Villard uh, Wednesday. But uh, they are playing good ball now, and it's going to be a tough ball game. Well, that's been, uh, we were talking about that conference a little earlier with Dick. That is a tough conference, and they've just had a, uh, uh, some real good teams to go up against. So uh, it doesn't mean that they're uh, you know, not with it this year just because they've lost to a team like Villard. Uh, they still have put together some pretty good, a pretty good year. Well, we actually thought Underwood was going to come out of that conference as the champions over there with uh, with the kids that they had 
but uh, apparently they just didn't put it together early enough, and now they are putting it together, and they're playing good ball, so we're going to have a tough ball game with them. Well, you've gotten uh, kind of a, ri a pretty good rivalry going there, uh, home and away thing with uh, Underwood over the last few years, haven't you? Yeah, we have a good rivalry in the fact that uh, we send a busload of vocational schools to Fergus for a vocational class in the afternoon, and the Underwood sends kids down there, so they actually go to school together in the afternoon. And so this builds up the rivalry yeah. just a little bit more. Okay, is everybody healthy now uh, on the Tigers team coming into Tuesday? Yeah, we, we've been very fortunate all year. We have never seen any real injuries all year long, so we are, other than a few bruises and some sore ankles, we're in very, very good shape for this game. You've got to have probably one of the biggest nose guards in, in nine-man football, don't you? In the stands, huh? Yeah, Dan, he's about, I think he's a little over 6'4", six, 6'4 four, six, four and a half, somewhere in there anyways. Well, he started out the season about 220. I think he's dropped a little bit down around 210. But uh, he does a real good job for us at that nose guard, uh, plugging the middle up. Uh, therefore, we can play our defensive ends. We play a three-man line. We can play our defense ends way on the outside, heads up on the ends, and Dan can control that that middle, the, the center, and the hole on either side of the center almost by himself. He's very tough to move out of there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yes, he moves. He moves very well for that size. Uh, right, he does. Is he? Now, he's a senior, I believe. Right, he's a senior. Uh, we'll, we have our center and our two guards are seniors, so we'll miss the our interior line after this year, and they've done a real good job for us this year. Have you got anybody uh, in the bullpen, so to speak, to come up there next year? Take it oh. We got uh, 11 juniors out for football, and uh, so we have quite a few different guys that will be competing for that spot. And whichever kid works the hardest, is probably end up getting the spot. Okay. Anything else uh, happening sports-wise up at Rod? Say, uh, gals volleyball. I know it's going strong. I thought maybe Roy could be down, but I don't see her. Uh they had the uh, district pairings. I guess Rossi was pair or number one uh, in the district. Uh, I believe Hillcliff is two. Yeah. Uh, so they'll be going into district competition. I think week after next, not this coming week, but the following week. Uh, Monday, I believe they have Breckenridge, which is the only game the girls have lost all year long. And they did. That was, I believe the first game of the season they played them, and they did go three games with them. Uh, Breck winning two out of the three. So I'm sure the girls are up to try get back at Breck again for their only loss of the year. So, uh, and they have two other games this coming week, but I'm not sure who they're with. Okay. I didn't mean to get you away from football that much, Leon. Is there anything else we want to talk about with the, uh, the football team, with the upcoming game and all? Uh, we covered how you see it uh, as a tough game. And uh, I don't know, does that take it uh, a little bit out of the out of the kids? They know they're out of the playoffs, but... Uh, I, don't, I don't really think so because uh, we knew when we went into the Audubon game that we didn't have a chance because we knew if Hillcrest won that game, they'd go in, or if Lake Park won, they'd go in as a champion. So we knew we didn't have a chance, but we knew that if Hillcrest beat Lake Park, we'd get second in the conference, which the kids were hoping for. And yet we still went into that game very fired up. The kids wanted that win. They wanted to do uh, another conference win. So, uh, no, I don't think that. Of course, it is a letdown that we don't get to go on. The kids would have liked to, but they're still playing good, fired up football. We might just talk a minute uh, about the nine-man football setup. I understand there will be some realignment. Some of these schools, uh, I was told that Herman and that conference in there uh, is considering going from 11 to nine-man, which would add some, some powerhouses, really. And then I think there's going to be some merging. I believe Kensington is merging with Hoffman, if I'm not mistaken. So you're going to have uh, maybe a little stiffer competition next year. Well, the the Peasant Conference has applied to go nine men. Now, I don't think they've gotten a final okay to do so, because I think what has to happen first, there has to be a vote by the nine man coaches before they can go nine men. So I'm not real sure on, on that if they've been allowed to go nine men or not. I don't think they have. Yeah, maybe not. I just heard the woman that the, that was being considered, and uh, of course, Herman has had a good 11 man football, and he's dropping down to nine, and it gives him that much more uh, depth. So uh, we'll have to wait and see that. Well, Leon, thanks for coming in this morning. Anything else at Ross Day? We missed the volleyball. Uh, I don't know what's coming up in sports. I guess we're going to be looking at the round ball pretty soon. And uh, Bill getting his boys ready for that. Yeah, that's coming up pretty quick. I believe in about a couple of weeks, of it. That'll, that practice will start. Okay. And we 
we'll uh, go back over and talk with the Fergus Falls coaches here again in just a moment. Uh, we're <coughs> shy on coaches. Before we do, let's take a look at some of these scores. We didn't run down the scores at the beginning of the show uh, that we do have from last night. Fergus Falls, as we mentioned, beat Bismarck Century 20 to 8. Bemidji over Crookston 27 to 6, giving the Lumberjacks the Northwest Conference title. Deep River Falls stopped the East Grand Forks 14 to 10. Linden Felton over Pelican Rapids 16 to 6. Some other uh, games, Litchfield over Montevideo, 30 to 6. Morris shut out Benson, 7-0. St. Cloud Cathedral down Breckenridge, 21 to 12. Moorhead defeated uh, Albert Lee, 15-14. And Fargo Shanley over Jamestown, 42 to 8. That sets up uh, Fargo and, or Shanley and Moorhead will meet next week, I believe, next Friday. Uh, also in North Dakota play, Fargo South over West Fargo, 30-0, and Fargo North over Grand Forks Central, 33-12. So three Fargo teams win, uh, winning yesterday. Sartell knocked off Big Lake, knocked them out of the unbeaten ranks, 15-0 in the Great River Conference. Fairmont over St. Peter, a squeaker, 20-19. As once beaten Fairmont, edged previously unbeaten St. Peter, uh, take over the lead in that South Central Conference. Hibbing had a close one. Cloquet gave him a scare, but Hibbing prevailed 17 to 16 and so those are some of the scores that we have uh, from yesterday <laughs>